see what happens here. Move us over here and move this over here and pray that the volume doesn't go blaring. One of these days I'll get this down. <laughs> <laughs> Probably after the pandemic's over. <laughs> okay. Oh, I guess we're live now, it says. It says we're live. I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> okay. So give us a second here. Oh, we got seven folks waiting for us here. Yay. Okay. Maybe, maybe I can, oh, Harry, stop it. <laughs> All righty. Good morning, everybody. We're so happy you're here. We're happy we're here. Sometimes we almost, almost don't make it here. <laughs> we're happy you joined us today. Lori, you got your coffee? I have my coffee. Good morning. I'd say we're ready. <laughs> okay. All you guys got your coffee out there? Um, I didn't get a chance to check for questions, so if you put one on the timeline previously, maybe you can add it in our comments and I'll, I'll try to read it. But we've got kind of a packed little show for you today. What are we talking about, Lori? Well, as much as we didn't want to talk about COVID every week, it's really all we have going on right now. So we're going to talk about the changes to the best practices and the, the guidelines that came out from the state and from CAR today. Yeah, this is kind of stealth. We're getting some, a lot of stealth stuff kind of hitting below the radar. And uh, it's, it's interesting because we're finding out about it after it's already gone into effect pretty much. Uh, but let's see what we're talking about today is the July 2nd revision of everybody's favorite book, the COVID guidelines. And we found some really good information on CAR for their FAQs. So um, when we're done, you guys might wanna go read those because that's really good information there. But Lori, go ahead and tell us what's changing. Yeah, so you know, thanks to Roxanne last week who pointed it out that the BPPP had changed. And it's interesting because for months, you know, we've been um, talking about going to the CAR microsite and in all of the uh, webinars that I attended in the last several months, the, the place to go is car.org slash COVID. And so that's where I go on a regular basis. And we get so used to going to these places that honestly, I didn't even recognize it was redirecting me to a different page. So when Lisa and I were having a conversation on Saturday, she said, well, you know, the document that's dated this. And I said, no, it's not. It's dated this. And we were it arguing almost over it. into a brawl. <laughs> <laughs> a brawl via Zoom. Uh, we were on two different pages. So mine, uh, my method of going in the car.org slash COVID was redirecting to the risk management section of CAR. And that's that's not a bad place to be, but it's different than what's on their COVID microsite. So Lisa let me know that on the landing page of car.org, the very top, there's an updates button essentially a link and you click on it and it takes you to that microsite so now we're on the same page but lo and behold there's different information on both of those pages so that's that's a concern for me so from that then we started digging deep into well what actually changed because that bppp changed on june 19th and then there's more information that references those changes and is the actual state guidelines dated July 2nd. So here we are now, July 6th, I think. Yes, 6th. And uh, I don't know what day it is. I don't know what day it is either. <laughs> hey, at least we're dressed. We're doing it's okay. It's after the 4th of July. That's all I know. Uh, so that information, you know, we needed to do a, a good comparison just to be sure we understood what those changes were. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay. So. so we can start with the BPPP um, because that's where this all started. And it went from five pages to two pages. And really what they did was they simplified it. There was so much information just crowded in in these categories that were difficult to follow. And if you are utilizing the PED and sending it out digitally like you're supposed to, 
you may not even notice it changed because as Lisa mentioned last week, you know, you, you look at page one, you look at page two, there's no initials or signatures required beyond that. So no one's paying attention. So the good news is they simplified it and they have it laid out more clearly where it's specific showing rules for listing and buyer's agent is the first category. And uh, point number two, do not hold open houses. And point number nine, discontinue providing handouts. Um, read all of the points in between, but those are the two I wanted to point out. And then on the second page, the next category is cleaning and disinfecting the property and sanitation products. And here's where I mentioned in the comments last week that it seemed like part of the burden had shifted because point number one says the agent who shows the property shall follow cleaning and disinfecting protocols and provide sanitation products unless otherwise agreed. So when I initially read that, my thought was, wow, the burden has shifted from the listing agent to the buyer's agent. And if you only go off this document, that would be an appropriate assumption. Thankfully, we have other documents to provide us additional information and help us determine that no, the burden hasn't shifted, but the buyer's agent needs to follow the protocols and, um, and provide the PPE. And we can talk about that in a couple minutes. Um, and point number two says real estate licensees. So who's that? Both, which one? Um, should ensure shown properties have proper sanitation products. Um, and it goes along uh, to explain that a little further. The third category is rules for every visitor. And the fourth category is rules for sellers. So read through that. It's really not very long and it's, it's pretty simple to understand. However, don't depend on just that document alone. Definitely. Because yeah, yeah I, and, and really how many people even know? You know, I mean, this is our biggest problem because it's really not clear. It's not clear who's really supposed to be doing what. And, you know, we need to all really understand things are pretty bad out there. You know, I, somebody had posted a, a random comment on Facebook. I don't remember who it was, but they were in the LA area. And they said, who knows somebody who's had COVID? Now, if you did this maybe six weeks ago, Nobody, 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 nobody. Oh, I heard of a friend whose cousin's brother, you know, died or something like that. But you weren't hearing the first hand. This thread, almost every remark was, yes, I know somebody, my cousin died. I know six people and four of them died. I know this, I know that, I know this, I know, you know. And it's getting closer. It's getting much closer. So, you know, it, I'm seeing with the um, lack of clarity as to who's responsible for what, I think that nothing is getting done. So I think it's going to become incumbent upon the agent, whether you're the listing agent or the uh, buyer's agent, just better clean up because number one, you don't know who's cleaned. Probably nobody's cleaned. <laughs> and you know, you got to take care of yourself and take care of your clients. Because one thing I notice myself when I'm out showing property is I tend to get lax as the day goes on. The first one, I'm all masked up and I got my gloves and I got my cleaning stuff. And by the end of the day, I'm just like, oh, well, you know, I can't take this anymore. But, you know, it's, you, you, we've got to understand the severity of the situation now is it's getting closer to home. More people are infected. You don't know who the last person in that house was, especially the vacants. Or I, I had one house that I went to where the agent scheduled people in every 15 minutes. And it was like a revolving door. And people are coming and going and coming and going. And she's like, well, you got to wear the booties. It was a pile of used booties. It wasn't even new booties. So you know, people are getting really lax out there. So we really have to have to spread the word of this virus is real. It's getting closer to home and we have to watch out for us, not only our clients, but ourselves as well. Right. And that's really the most important message out of all of that, because, you know, we can talk about whose responsibility is, but at the end of the day, you're responsible for yourself and our jobs in 
protecting our clients is to protect them in this way too. And so we don't have any knowledge about what happens in that house before we enter it. And we, we shouldn't assume that somebody else has cleaned it. Now, I'm not suggesting as a buyer's agent, you go in and clean the entire house, but you need to be mindful that it's probably not been cleaned. And, you know, one, one time I went to the grocery store with my husband um, early on and I forgot gloves. And so I just walked around with my arms behind my back, crossed, but behind my back. And I walked around the grocery store because I needed to make sure I didn't touch anything. And that was the only way I could do it. Put your hands in your pockets, but that's kind of the mentality we have to go in with is we have no idea and let's just assume everything has a bunch of germs and not touch it. And then should we, as the agents sort of wipe things down? Well, if we don't touch anything, I, I don't think we should have to wipe things down, but whatever we touch, I'm going to have a disinfectant wipe in my hand and wipe it down. I mean, I do that on a daily basis. When I go to my mailbox, I go out there, I have to use my key to open my mailbox. I go out, I unlock it, I grab my mail, I close it up, I come in, I've touched my doorknob and I've got sanitizer right there and disinfectant wipes. And I wipe down my keys and I wipe down my doorknob and I close the door and then I go to the kitchen and wash my hands. You know, and that's just going to my own mailbox. So I haven't shown properties in the last four months. Um, I'm glad I haven't shown properties in the and last four months. You're so lucky <laughs> you haven't shown properties. I'm grateful that the transaction I closed uh, was literally a week before we shut down and we no longer had to go to that property. So, you know, it's important to just understand that, that we have to protect ourselves. And what I love about the FAQ, so, so what happened with the FAQ was the state, um, not the state, but the um, Department of well, OSHA, the Department of um, California Department of Public Health, and then OSHA updated that guideline, the packet that Lisa showed, the blue one. They updated that, and you know they're writing this from the perspective of the workplace. That's OSHA's purview is the workplace, and so all throughout it was employee, 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 and um, you know it's labeled for real estate transactions. I kind of look at it as they might have written it from the point of view of they're looking at workplace real estate, which is like on-site property management, um, model homes being showed, because the explanations of having the employees have extra time to do the cleaning didn't translate directly to us, but that's our guidance. And so in the, in the new version of it, the newest version, They've replaced employees with workers. And the truth of the matter is we are workers and our workplace is in other people's homes. So we have, we might have our office and we have our home office certainly, but you know, their oversight includes our physical offices, which we have an office. Um, but it also include, includes the places where we go to work, which includes the properties we're showing. So the language that was updated there um, really emphasized the mask requirement. So if you, if you take a look at it, you know, there's now a full page. Um, I think it's like page three. Yep, it's, it's the second page of text and this whole page is about mask. And it wasn't in the previous one because at the time there wasn't a state mandate that you had to wear a mask. And this is some really interesting information in here because I don't think most people are following this. Uh, you know, they say people in California must wear face coverings when they are engaged in work, whether at the workplace or performing work offsite, when they're interacting in person with any member of the public, uh, working in any space visited by members of the public, regardless whether anyone from the public is present at the time. Uh, there's some food things. This one I thought was interesting. Working in or walking through common areas such as hallways, stairways, elevators, and parking facilities. You know, I, our office, you know, we have an office in Rancho Santa Margarita and we have a communal restrooms. And it's like, you know, to me, the scariest part is going from our office to the bathroom and back because I'm walking through there. I'm the only masked up person that I ever see in our office building. Nobody's, you know, nobody else is doing it. 
So if they're not wearing a mask in the halls to go get the mail or go up and down the stairs or whatever, I'm pretty sure they're not wearing one in the bathroom either. So, you know, we're supposed to, we're, they, they have to operate under the same thing. Anybody in any workplace has to operate under these. People are not doing it. So just be aware, you're touching, you're touching doors, you're opening mailboxes. Like what Lori says, she's going to her house. Imagine what the office mailbox situation might be like. So, you know, and also uh, any room or enclosed area where other people are present when unable to physically distance. So this is good information to know when you're just out and about what people are supposed to be doing, but we need to be following this carefully. Absolutely. And, and within that page, if you go online and you view it online, there's a um, hyperlink to look at what they've just labeled as guidance. And it's a three page um, guidance for the use of face masks from face coverings from California Department of Health. And it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of duplication in their info that they've put in this um, OSHA document. But there's some other interesting information just for personal use. So I would recommend that. And um, you know, we can put the link of where to find this. I was going to say we could upload all these documents for you guys, but you need to know where to find it. You, you know, you can't just really depend on it to provide it. <laughs> quite easy to find. Just go to the CAR website and and just hop on. Don't go to legal documents like Lori because you ain't going to find it there. <laughs> go to the, you know, the COVID micro site and their update is right at the top right now. And that has a hyperlink in it to the guidelines. Um, you know, most of the stuff that was changed really, you know, besides the addition and expansion of face masks, a lot of it was changing the word out from employee to worker, especially in our industry. We need to not call people employees. We need to call them workers. And uh, one thing that I thought that was interesting was topics for worker training. They expanded... Um, some of the reasons why you shouldn't be coming to work. And one of the things that they didn't really have in there so clearly before was the importance of not coming to work if you have symptoms, if you have been diagnosed and not yet been released from isolation, or within the past 14 days, a worker has had contact with someone who has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and is considered potentially infected. So, you know, you really need to think about it. And I know for myself, uh, I, uh, I'm hearing of, you know, a friend of mine had a, um, a slab leak and they brought workers in to clean up the, the property. And thank God nobody was staying at the property when the cleaning was done. Because it turns out that one of the workers has COVID-19. So, you know, they had to go in and Lysol down the entire place and, you know, scrub and do everything. But you can't control the other people. And, it's, it, and remember, we're getting to it's where it's one step away. So if you think you've been around somebody, um, you probably are better off staying at home for a couple of weeks and just, you know, work, work can survive. You can survive without going around, especially in our business, walking into people's homes if you've had an encounter. And I think we just all need to be aware that it's probably more likely than not, we're all going to be in that situation. Yeah, it's good information in here. I think they've, they've updated it in such a way that it feels more relevant to how we operate. Mm -hmm. What else the going? Well, um, and then from that, CAR made the updated their FAQ. And it's um, it's called FAQ Industry Guidance on Showings. And I'm, I'm certain that they will convert it to a format where we can easily print. Right now it's just text on the web page. And so if you print it, it doesn't really print very well. So I just highlighted it and copied and pasted it into Word. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of great information here. You know, they're pulling information from the OSHA document. They're pulling information that we've seen before and they're, they're posing it in the, in the, um, as a question, like they usually do in their FAQs, that these are the questions that we continue to ask. And so, you know, a lot of it is the same. Um, they've updated a couple of places, but a couple of things that I highlighted when I read it, um, one of the questions is, what is the authority of the Department of Public Health to issue these guidelines? 
and it talks about the governor's order. Um, but what I highlighted was these questions and answers, meaning this document, are directives from the state public health officer and have the same force and effect as other state public health officer directives. So essentially, this is our mandate. Um, they have the same force and effect. So health department could also be one entity that's, that's going to be involved in the oversight of this. Um, another section, a couple of questions down, are brokers and agents legally permitted to show properties? Yes, however, according to the industry guidance, showing should be done virtually whenever possible. So, you know, we've emphasized that a lot. A few pages in, um, so several questions down, whose prevention plan is being agreed to? Does the buyer have to agree to the prevention plan of the listing broker? Yes, the buyer must agree to the prevention plan of the listing broker. In fact, even the buyer's agent is supposed to agree to the listing broker's prevention plan, as does everyone who enters the property. Um, who is responsible for posting the rules for entry? So per the BPP, it's the listing agent's responsibility to make sure that the rules for entry are posted. However, it would be possible to have the buyer's agent agree to do this. Why did they even have to say that? Just, just make it the listing agent. Um, but again, the agent whose plan is being implemented has the duty to regularly evaluate compliance with the plan and correct deficiencies identified. Um, and then our, our favorite question, can I hold open houses? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, indus the industry guidance states, quotes, discontinue holding open houses and showings open to the general public on a walk-in basis. Use an appointment or digital sign-in process to control the number of people in the house or property, end quote. Okay. We got that and people are doing that. They are getting um, their scheduling appointments and they feel compliant. However, it continues on. Open houses are generally understood to be on a walk-in basis without needing an appointment. Appointment-based systems are not really open houses in the general understanding of the industry and public. Therefore, to present a true picture under Article 12 of the Code of Ethics, one should conform to the normal understanding of the term. Keep in mind you are required to thoroughly clean the property between showings. So what this means is, <clears throat> if you want to do an open house, open house in the general sense is considered a walk-in basis. And if you are misrepresenting that, you might be in violation of Article 12 of the Code of Ethics. So if you plan to do your open house, not really open house, um, don't call it an open house. Don't call it a virtual open house. You need to make sure that it's appointment only, only showings. And if, you, and if you want to find a way to make it appear to be an open house, you better not use the words open house. Uh, or you're going to be in violation of Article 12 of the Code of Ethics. And it sounds like they're actually going to try to do some enforcement as well. That was one thing that the governor said. Now, what happens if they catch you? I have absolutely no idea. No, no, no. <laughs> kind of like those water saving fixtures, you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. but they can do anything at any time that they want. And I don't know, um, you know, the OSHA is one of the enforcement um, uh, agencies out there. So we don't know who they are, what they do, where they're going, how they're finding people, what areas they're looking. I mean, you got to remember our previous real estate commissioner, Wayne Bell, used to drive around neighborhoods when he, when he was in town to speak at different places looking for non-compliant signs. Okay, so you don't know who's out there looking for what. So, you know, number one, I, you know, I don't think it's a good look myself. Um, I, there's no way that I'm going to go into the area that I farm and put a bunch of signs up saying open house, open house, open house, and look irresponsible because to me, that's what it looks like to me. 
it's I'm putting myself and my business ahead of my own personal safety, the safety of my homeowner and the safety of the public. It, it appears to me an extremely selfish action. Um, I'm wigged out when I find something left on my door still. You know, I don't, you know, if anybody's leaving a flyer on my porch, I'm like, good God, I don't want to touch this. How do I know, you know, who, who they are and where they've been? So, you know, you kind of have to think, what is the public perception of this? And, you know, perception is reality. If people see you out, you know, delivering flyers or holding open house, and they're part of the mindset that that's not the loud people on Facebook, let's say, not the, not the Karens of the world or whatever, but, oh, that agent's not taking things seriously. That's going to stick with you. That's going to be something that you're not going to be able to erase out of the public's mind. So, really, you know, we really need to think, and I'm not seeing a lot of agents doing it, but I'm seeing the same agents doing it. And my opinions of those agents has, has changed because um, now it's like, it's all about you, isn't it? It's just all about you, all about you and your business and having your signs up so the neighbors can see that you're busy. I mean, we all know that that's why these people are doing this, but is it really that important? Because the public's probably saying, yeah, I don't want to deal with that person. Yeah, you made some really good points there because, you know, I know we sound like the, the no open house, you know, advocates of the world. And, you know, we're not trying to prevent our industry from doing business. We're really not. It's just we need to be really careful of that public perception. We need to make sure that we're not hurting our industry further because we already have a bad enough reputation. And so if we're out there and we're looking like we're being opportunistic because of this situation, you know, that doesn't look good for any of us. It affects all of us. So, you know, I know I keep saying no open houses, no open houses. That's because that's what our guidance tells us. And we have to, we have to follow the guidance. That's part of remaining in good standing with our local board of realtors and following the code of ethics. All of these rules apply to us for a reason because we are professionals. We are held to a higher standard and we should hold ourselves to a higher standard. But yes, you can still operate. You just need to operate within the guidelines and, and not trying to make the guidelines fit to your situation, to your desire. So if you want to hold appointment only tours, more power to you, do it. Just don't put out open house signs. Um, somewhere in here, it, it specifically says, I think it's in the CAR one pager, do not use open house signs, okay? It can't get any clearer than that. I didn't highlight that, so I'm not sure which page it's on, but you know, it can't get any clearer than that. Um, we have to make sure that we are meeting the expectations of these guidance because for your risk management, if you're not following the guidance, you're gonna be a, in a world of hurt, not just from violating the code of ethics, but your ENO will most likely not be covered because now that's gross negligence. You did not follow the guidance. So a couple other points on this document. Um, and, and before we move on from that point, um, you know, I think a lot of these people are also thinking that the PED form is going to save them. But let's think about that. If you walk into an open house and you tell somebody, oh, here, use my pen and use my clipboard. And Jeff, I'm going to get to your, met your, your question soon. But here, sign this this. PEAD form, which they're going to say, well, what's this? And maybe it gets explained to them. Maybe it doesn't get explained to them. So they sign it and date it. Do you have their contact information? If this is a stranger, I mean, you know, I mean, let's seriously think about this. You know, I'm letting random strangers into somebody's property and I have no contact information because guess what? They're probably going to do to you what they did to you on an open house before this all started, they're probably going to give you bogus information because they don't want you bugging them. So another reason why you don't want to do this. And believe me, I've been in two listings where these agents have been doing the virtual open houses. They got flyers. They've got notepads. They're handing crap out. They don't. They, they might have a token bottle of hand sanitizer. Sanitizer more coffee. Um, but, 
you know, really there it's not safe. And I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt for just a second because Jeff Campbell, he's been very persistent, and we all know how Jeff Campbell can be. And he's out, Jeff's kind of out in the middle of nowhere doing business, and <laughs> they have problems with Wi-Fi. They have problems, I guess, with people knowing how to do things electronically. And he's questioning the, you know, do things electronically when you can, because he's saying he can't always. His clients are, are having to sign things because they don't have a Wi-Fi connection and stuff like that. Well, I know, I know Jeff, and I know Jeff is a really good broker who is going to follow the rules very carefully. That potentially is a legitimate reason why you can't do it electronically. You know, if he, if, if they have properties in areas that are more remote, I mean, we've all been there. We, you know, our GPS craps out on us. You know, if you can't do it electronically, to me, that's a, that's a legitimate reason you can't. Now, does that mean if you're in the middle of San Diego, you can use that excuse? I don't think so. So I think it depends where you are. Um, so you have to plan accordingly. And if you are sitting at an open house, relying on people in the nearby area to try to do things electronically, that's probably not going to work very well. And you have to have a, a backup plan for that. And, and I would say, you know, it might be worthwhile to document what that plan is. You know, maybe it's simply providing the extra protections at the property, you know, you better, you better darn have that sanitizer and, the, and or a place for them to wash their hands if you need to facilitate paperwork back and forth. So I think that's a legitimate reason. Yeah, and also too, you could, you know, have a pen to give them that they can keep that, you know, having gloves and pick it up and hand it to them, uh, then ask them to sign it and take a picture of it and text that back to you. You know, you've seen them sign it, but just have them text it back to you. Take a picture so, of the form? Yeah, picture of the form. So you are not physically exchanging the form. You know, just a thought. Just a thought. Good idea. But yeah. they may not have data to send the text message either, though. That's true. I forgot. These people are out there in the middle of nowhere. They probably got septic tanks and various other things. So I wouldn't know anything I know. About. Things we don't know anything about. <laughs> That's a great question, you know, and, and I think that we, there are circumstances that require us to figure out how to operate differently, and that's certainly a good example. So good job, well, Jeff. And do you want me to go to questions now, or do you want to finish talking? about? Um, it? Well, let me do one more point. Um, it, you know, it references um, whose job is it to provide the sanitizer and masks, and, and it references the agent who shows the property shall follow the cleaning and disinfecting protocols and provide sanitation products unless otherwise agreed. And then it's, it also states as general risk management advice, we also recommend that all agents have these sanitation products at the ready since if they show a property and the products are not available, then really you're violating the industry guidance in showing the property. So if you're a buyer's agent and you show up assuming the listing agent will provide that in that um, PPE and they don't, and you still show the property, you're in violation of the industry guidelines. So always have your stash with you. I uh, have a bag of crap in the front seat of my car. <laughs> yes, I, I, think, I think we all do just for life in general at this point. Yeah. Uh, whose job what? is it to clean the property before and after the showing? You know, here's where it says the agent who shows the property shall follow the cleaning and disinfecting protocols. Um, but keep in mind that the brokerage whose plan is being implemented, almost always the listing brokerage, it says, must regularly evaluate the plan. So then the, the last question um, that I want to bring up is, can the job of cleaning be shifted to the buyer's agent? And I love that they use that word because that's the exact word that I used last week. Has it been shifted? And so it says, while there's nothing in the industry guidance prohibiting this, the listing agent and broker will retain ultimate responsibility to ensure that the cleaning is done. So again, the effort to shift the responsibility is not a recommended risk management practice since it will likely set up the listing agent and brokerage for a violation of the industry guidance. So, you know, when we ask the question, well, whose job is it? Well, I'll go back to my general statement. It's all of our jobs, but ultimately that responsibility for ensuring the cleaning is done is on the listing broker. 
coverage. But as a buyer's agent, you know, I'm going to be armed with my PPE and I'm going to make sure that my disinfectant wipes uh, touch everything we may have touched. Well, just out of curiosity on that, I'm seeing in the MLS quite a bit that they're saying buyer's agent to provide mask and, and whatever. Is that okay for them to shift that responsibility in the MLS is, or is that a violation? What's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that's where it's, it's ambiguous. I think that if their prevention plan states that they're relying on the other agents to provide it, then you need to follow that. And your responsibility as a buyer's agent is to ensure that, that those products are provided. Otherwise, you're in violation. So can they shift it? Well, that one sentence says, although it's not specifically prohibited, so they can give us instruction that it's our job, but ultimately the burden falls on them. I was having a conversation uh, in the last few days from an agent who said that um, after showing a property, she heard from the listing agent that the owners were watching the showings on the ring through the mm -hmm. ring. Which I don't know if that was disclosed. That's a different conversation, but they were watching the showings and, and, and my friend is the only one who followed protocols. She had her own stuff. She, I mean, she described it, you know, we, we hand sanitized, we put on gloves, we hand sanitized again, we walked around, we disposed of the gloves, we hand sanitized again. And so as the listing brokerage, if I am aware that my plan is not working, then it's my responsibility to adjust my plan. And so in, in, that, in that specific example, I think leaving the responsibility on the buyer's agents proved their plan doesn't work. Because if one out of, I don't know how many showed that day, it sounded like it was, you know, at least four or five. Um, if one out of one out of five, 20% of them followed the plan, that listing brokerage is at risk. They're in violation of the industry guidance. And the only one that was uh, complying was, was the friend of mine. So Green doorbells are not your friend right now. <laughs> if, if you're a buyer's agent, maybe even as a listing agent, because your clients are watching, your clients are watching. Believe me, I know this as a fact. <laughs> Your clients are watching you and they're, watch they're, they're listening to the conversation you're having on the porch. They're watching to see if anything is being done. Um, it's really kind of interesting because I had, I had a listing where there was a ring doorbell and thank God the gal didn't have her subscription up to date because then it would have all been recorded, but it was notifying her every time somebody was on her porch. And there were a lot of conversations going on and she could hear all of them. So remember that. And recorded, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, well hers, she could just watch it, but she couldn't, she didn't, she didn't record it because she didn't pay her subscription. Okay. But most people pay for their subscriptions. So be very, aware. And I think it's something we need to start putting in our listings because people, when you say, you know, you, you have to notify somebody if they're being recorded, you know, or if there's recording devices in the home or whatever, we're forgetting about all those doorbells. And yeah, it hadn't even occurred to me when she mentioned it. I don't have one, so I don't think about it on a, on a normal basis anyway, but that might be the a proper time to implement that other new form which is, I forget the name of it, the property property visit and open house. I think it's PVOH. Mm -hmm. That's a new form that came out, you know, a week or two ago. You know, it may be worthwhile to include that along with the PEDS. I think I'm going to start doing that because I got a new listing coming up that's got a ring doorbell. <laughs> yeah, because it specifically uh, references uh, recording devices. Um, and I'm sure it probably specifically mentions the doorbells. Yeah. Let's take a closer look. Definitely. There was one thing that I noticed here that made me extremely happy because uh, in the old rules, it was saying 
that people should be washing their hands, that there should be soap and water provided. And, and if not, then they can do hand sanitizer. They changed it where it's, you can wash your hands or use hand sanitizer. So that made me quite happy to see that because- Did it say before? It said you had to do both? Uh, it said, oh gosh, do I, I don't think I printed out the old page. Uh, it, it basically said that you would want to do hand washing. And if you couldn't hand wash, then you would use hand sanitizer. Okay. Now they're equating the two to be equal. So you don't have to have all of that stuff because that, that wasn't working out so good. You know, I, <laughs> when I was showing property, I sh I've shown a lot of property in the past few weeks. And after you showed them virtually. Of course. Oh no, believe me. Yes, we, we, yes. I've spent a lot of time. <laughs> I'm really happy. I've only got like one buyer going, you know, thank God we opened escrow. Yay. Uh, Cause it will take a lot out of you, <laughs> but we only ran into a couple of places that had it where you could wash your hands. And actually we were quite excited to see it because after I think we were on house number seven, um, we had six coatings of hand sanitizer from every house that we had been in and your hands start getting kind of so it was like oh boy oh boy oh boy oh boy let's wash our hands but then the trash was shoved under the sink and so you know you're just like oh this is just not good so I don't know maybe just less showings at a time so you can wash your hands but um anyhow let's get into some of these questions here Pam asked and only Pam would ask this, and I have I have the visual in my head of this going on. Is it okay if I take the temperature of workmen, inspectors, et cetera? <laughs> no, you can just see Pam. Pam. With <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, if if your prevention plan requires that anyone that enters has to get their, their temperature taken, because for your office, you can absolutely include that. So if you're talking workers at a house, you know, I would I would have the conversation with the foreman ahead of time to say, look, for everyone's protection, this is what we're gonna do. And then it shouldn't be a big deal. And I can see Pam doing this because Pam would be the temperature police. We love you, Pam. <laughs> okay, what else we got going in here? Let's see, we talked about Jeff out there. I'm not an attorney. This is just my personal opinion from but having- we play ones on TV. Having <laughs> <laughs> Having been involved with a number of the strangest legal things that have come up in my career in the decade, uh, for over a decade, um, I have a pretty good insight into, you know, how, how a, a judge and a jury is going to interpret something, so. Exactly. And Daniel Wu wants to know if there's a bounty system in place because he wants to earn <laughs> some money reporting open houses. Pam kind of likes that. I personally think the two of them need to get together and figure this out, you know? That could be, you know, this is going to spark new ideas for our industry. That could be a whole new job category. I think it could be a reality show. That would be kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. And Janine Marie Brown says, I heard through the grapevine that there was a fifth $15,000 fine for not following the guidelines. Couldn't find it in the documents. Might have been looking through the old ones. Don't know about that. If anybody finds anything about fines, let us know. Absolutely. Because then we're going to join Daniel and Pam on their bounty system. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. And Tiffany asks, how are others marketing yourselves right now? I'm digitally marketing and it's working on a small scale, but door knocking and networking are off the table for the foreseeable future. And yeah, I can feel your pain, Tiffany, on that one. You know, I was a big open house holder. I love doing open houses. And my my marketing plan from six months, has it been six months? Yeah, still six months ago, uh, basically has been put in the toilet. There's, you know, everything that I was doing, I'm not doing anymore. and is really making me get more in contact with my past clients. It's making me really reassess my marketing. Um, you know, what am I doing that's actually worth my time and worth my money? Uh, you know, I'd say look, look long and hard at how you get your business and then figure out what works for you. And maybe what you were doing 
isn't going to work so much, but what can you do now? What's another way? I think the geographic farmers really have it hard because it's still not good to be putting pieces out. Um, you know, you really just kind of have to get creative, rebudget, rethink. I'm going to use a term that I used to love, but now I loathe, which is pivot and adapt. Sorry, Lori. <laughs> I know I kind of visibly flinched when they said that. <laughs> but, yes, we have, we, have a, we both have an equal aversion to words that are overused. <laughs> on our journey through COVID-19. <laughs> yes, yes. No, I agree. I mean, you know, I think, I think when we had the, the first shutdown, we all said, okay, this is temporary. We'll get through it. Okay, wait, it's taking a little longer than we expected, but oh, light at the end of the tunnel, we're reopening and the world will get back to more normal in the coming months. And then we had this second, um, it's not really a shutdown. It's certainly not the second wave, but it's not the second shutdown. It's just some industries are starting to tighten up and restaurant industry, obviously, hotel industry. So we're seeing this sort of second generation, second layer of shutdown. And to me, that means we absolutely have to think long and hard about how we conduct our business because we haven't seen any anything really loosen up. We haven't seen it tighten up, but we haven't seen it loosen up, which means our consumers are going to get used to this. They're going to, sellers are going to get used to more limitations on how many people come through their house. So I think we have to seriously give some thought of which parts of how we're operating now are going to stay for the long term. And, and I'm not thinking long term as the next three to six months. I'm thinking beyond that. I think some of these practices will remain. And so how can we adapt? So, you know, I think there's, there's options for the geographical farmer. If you have any, um, recognition in your farm already, it's easy to, to send out a mailer and say, hey, I miss you all. And, you know, I'm not going to be able to do all the things I normally do, but I want to keep you engaged. You know, please go, you know, please email me your email address so I can continue to send you things or please join the Facebook group I set up for this area. I think there's still ways with the geographical farm that you can engage your people, but let them know, you know, for their protection, you're not going to be mailing every month. You're not going to be dropping off. Um, but I think one mailer to let them know that would be appropriate. Yeah, I think that that's a great idea. And, you know, Daniel made a remark about, um, you mean a branded pen to give them? That almost sounds like marketing. Of course it's marketing, Daniel. And you know what else is marketing? Hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer. See, I don't know if you can see that, but it says Lisa Dunn hand sanitizer. Can't think of anything better than that to give somebody when I'm wearing a pair of gloves, handing it to them. <laughs> Which, and you know, to, to full disclosure, you ordered those like in January and received them, what, end of February, very beginning of March? Yeah, I had a conference that I was, um, I was at and I was trying to think back in, you know, December and January, what is a good handout? Because people used to make fun of me when we would go to meetings about Lisa Dunn and her hand sanitizer. Well, look who got the last laugh now. So I have, you know, it's not cheap, but it's a good giveaway. And I'm not, you know, like walking down the street, handing it to people, but I make it available. Um, to anybody who wants them. It was great at the conference because it was right when the whole COVID thing was just starting to happen. Uh, about that time, I had that encounter with that gentleman that I was talking to that spit and hit me in the head, which made me very sensitive to these things. Um, but I handed that out to everybody at the conference and people were just overjoyed to get them. Not easy to get now. I'm not sure you know, how, how the reordering is. But, uh, you know, if you're going to do a giveaway, think about something that's like really worth it. A pen is always good, especially it's like, you know what, um, I, here's a pen. I don't, you know, to sign this, I don't want it back. Keep the pen um, after you've, you know, cleaned it up with hand sanitizer or whatever. But, you know, you can still market. You just have to be smart. You just have to really get creative and smart. And really, for those of us that love the business, we're going to find a way to keep going. You know, I'm, I'm busy as all get out. And it's, it's not through, well, it's actually through my social, my social group 
that I really kind of took for granted until right now. And this has been the source of my business. So I'm really nice and busy and enjoying things, you know, with people that know me. So I really don't have to get out there and put flags up in the neighborhood. And, you know, I, I think we all just need to take a long, hard look at how we've been doing things and what we can do to change and be more efficient. And it was interesting, Lori, that you mentioned how we might be doing things different from here on out. There was uh, something I read about is how we've been handling with um, the COVID situation going to continue in how we deal with when we have a cold, when we get the flu, are we gonna start being more conscientious around other people? Um, people were um, polled in this particular article and they you know, asked them, you know, would you go into work you know, with the flu? And people were like, oh yeah, yeah, I, you know, I can't miss work. I've got to go in there. And it's like, you know, you're, you're kind of being selfish about, well, my you know, business can't survive without me, I have to show up. And maybe this is going to teach us all, you know what, maybe kind of, you know, wear a mask if you think you might be coming down with something. Don't get around people because you don't have to. You can still function without being right next to people all the time. And I really appreciate that because the sickest I've got was from people that said, oh, I have to be at this meeting while they're running temperatures with the flu and speaking right in my face and I'm like I'm gonna get sick I'm gonna get sick and guess what I got sick so yeah and not only will it affect how how we behave when we're sick it'll affect how we communicate with others who are sick and exactly. so we're gonna be less worried about offending them if we tell them go home you mm -hmm. should not be here with us because we already experience it now if you're out with, you know, your family um, or just in public at the grocery store in general, I mean, don't we all sort of turn our head when we hear someone cough or sneeze? I mean, we're yes. all like, yeah. on high alert. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, when we're, we're, we're at our functions or at the workplace, you know, we're all going to be extra careful and we're not going to tolerate people coming in sick anymore. Yeah, I really think we won't. Um, Melody had a good point. She says, what I see are and here is do whatever you want. Don't listen to anyone. Don't follow the rules implemented by OSHA. Hold open houses. Just don't call it an open house. Don't sanitize after showings. No more than one person with the agent. Broker supervision. Where is the broker supervision? That's a very good question. Um, I hope she didn't hear that from us. I hope she's she's referring to hearing it, you know, out in the world. Um, that's just really disappointing. You know, I, I mean, I believe it. I'm certain that it's happening, uh, but it's so disappointing because yeah, it is, it's all of our responsibility. And, you know, a broker can't certainly watch and witness everything their agents do, but there needs to be a protocol in place. There needs to be directions from the top that says, this is how we're going to operate. And, you know, if, it's for the public good, but it's also for the reputation of the business as well. You know, I mentioned earlier about the reputation of the industry. Well, that is also reputation. Uh, our company's reputation is something we have to protect as well. So that's horrible. And, and I know Melody, I know she's a rule follower. So, you know, we may have to have Daniel go down there and, and do some bounty hunting for her. Yeah, Daniel, there could be some big money in this for you. <laughs> And I like Pam's comment. Oh, no, we have to be smart. You know, there, there's a little acronym floating around out there called RDR. Uh, -E -R -R Realtors don't read. And yeah, we have to we have to kind of remind some people about, you know, what the proper um, you know, use of PPE is, you know, one of the things that was driving me crazy was um, I, it appears that I'm going to become my own listing police again, continued. Uh, and people were showing up for showings and they have their own mask. And I really wanted them to wear disposable masks, but then it's like, you know, well, you know, they're wearing their mask. I, you know, that, that just got to be like too weird. So I stayed away from it. But the watching of the gloves, and I know Joyce had mentioned this earlier in the comments, that people would be in their car putting their gloves on open, touch your steering wheel, open their door, go on out. It's like, ah, those are used gloves. At this point, these are used gloves. And 
I'm kind of a big believer in the gloves because, you know, if you put them on at the front door and then they run around and if they touch stuff, they touch stuff, but then they take them off the right way, which is turn them inside out. And then with that inside out glove in the other hand, pull the other one off inside out and they're all rolled up inside out with no muck that you can really Unless get. Unless they have muck on their hands to begin with. No. Exactly. Um, but they need to put them on when they come in, take them off when they go out. Disposable mask, put them on when they go in, take them off when they go out. Shoe covers, put new, fresh, clean shoe covers on when you go into the house, take them off, throw them in the trash when you're done. This reusing shoe covers business is disgusting. Or when they say, take off your shoes. Well, you're making me cover my shoes. So why do I want to be walking around here in my socks? Let's really think about, you know, it's not, are we worried about the carpet or are we worried about germs? Which one is it? Shoe coverings. If you're going to go that route, go new shoe coverings. Um, let's see. Oh, it's getting late here. Let's see. Uh, Daniel Wu, sorry. You just have bounty money to go find some black market hand sanitizer. That's all I can tell you about that. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Oh, and Tiffany know, Daniel says, is such a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he just gets better. You're going to have to read these comments. <laughs> um, and Tiffany Lammer says, so true. When I actually read my entire brokerage agreement, my broker complimented me for reading it. Apparently most don't. So yeah, it. most don't. One last thing um, on. Okay. Let's say we're reading the, the MLS thing where the listing agent says you need to bring your own gloves and, and mask and shoe covers. Should I, could I challenge them to say, show me what your best practices where it says I have to bring them. You could, you'd ask for their prevention plan. And let's all make, take guesses. How many people even remotely think that these agents even know what their brokerage prevention plan is. Okay, Harry, we know you're not going to use shoe coverings. Okay, any, feel free to put your guesses in here. Not that we're ever going to know because, well, we know realtors don't read. Um, <laughs> well, you know where ours is. We know where ours is, yes. Yeah, you guys can only imagine how complete, complete's the word I'm <laughs> for Laurel Real Estate Resources compliance because our broker of record is also the queen of compliance. So, <laughs> but uh, thank you, Lana, for saying great information. I hope everybody got something out of this today. Lori, do you got any parting thoughts, comments, words? You know, I just, I just strongly urge everybody to go to the site print out all the information, read it, and make sure that you share it with others. Make sure that we're educating our fellow realtors, you know, whether it's within your brokerage or outside, you know, that's outside of your brokerage. It's the only way everyone's going to find out. Exactly. Well, and if anybody has any ideas for things for us to cover next week, unless something crazy happens, which I'd like to say that wouldn't be the case, but I bet something crazy is going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, 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 we got a late ad on the questions. Let's say, let's say we all, we follow all the rules and get a property in escrow. How are the inspections being handled? I had one recently that the buyer was relocating. So I waited outside in mask for inspector to finish. But what if I have buyers that want to come in? The buyers can come in. So, um, so in the guidance, it talks about the buying parties being allowed to go in. You know, you have, you have more control over it once you're in escrow, you know, before you're in escrow and you're just showing, you know, the, the language states to show virtually when possible. And so, you know, at some point it's just no longer possible because these buyers want to get in and you can have pre-scheduled appointments. But once you're in escrow, you have a little more freedom. And, you know, I think that you're doing great with staying in the car um, and allowing the buying party to go in. Now you have to coordinate with the home inspector. The home inspector might prefer to be in there by himself, him or herself. And so, you know, just make sure you have that conversation because ideally the home inspector's in there by, by himself doing his report, maybe then inviting the buyers in 
um, you know, at the very end to kind of walk through real quickly with the appropriate social distancing. Um, a lot of home inspectors are doing that through um, like FaceTime, you know, they're just walking them through. So uh, you can have the buying party in there, but a lot of the language references still really like two people at a time, two people plus their agent. So just, you know, be, be mindful of that. The requirement is still to social distance. Um, so you don't want to bring in the whole family. Like Lisa, you were going to be taking your buyer um, yesterday for, wasn't it for their home inspection or to show the family or something? Mm -hmm. And how many people ended up coming? There was a total of six of us there. Okay. And so you had them go in two at a time. I kind of had some go see one part of the house while the other was in the backyard and kind of tried to rotate. And I tried to stay away from everybody. I was more like the traffic cop. Was it perfect? By God, no. Did most of these people live in the same household? Yes. So it was mainly keeping the people that didn't li live in the same household away from each other. Because if they're all in the same household, I mean, you know, the, there was um, three to four of them that were kind of traveling in a pack, which was fine because they're all, you know, it's just like going out to dinner at that point. You know, when people go to a restaurant, it's supposed to be with people in your household, which we know nobody's going out to dinner with people in their household. They're getting together with friends. But, you know, I tried my best. I'm not going to say it was perfect by any means, but everybody was masked up. Everybody had gloves. Um, you know, I, I, feel good about it. Uh, I wiped down everything that I could when I was done. So, you know, I, I feel that I did the best that I could. Um, but that's like the only time we're going to have that many people in there. And hopefully I don't have to do it again. But um, one one last question, though, somebody had put in here saying if you're going to have like workers come in for something, let's say maybe an inspector, you're ordering from a, an inspection company, and they send an inspector in. Does the inspector sign the PED form or does the company sign the PED form or perhaps would both of them sign it? It's whoever's entering the property is, is required to sign. Okay. So I think again, you know, have a conversation with that company and find out what their prevention plan is because they will have protocols for them to go onto a work site as well. And you wanna make sure that there's alignment with, with your plan or the listing agent's plan um, so that everyone's on the same page, you know, it's, it's easy to have those conversations, you know, what are your protocols? Like my dad was going to a doctor's office the other day and he was, he's in his seventies. He was worried about going. And he, when they called to confirm, he said, you know, what's your plan? How is this going to work? He wanted to know ahead of time because he had gone to a different appointment um, to have blood drawn and they were only allowing like one person in the waiting room. So the hallway was cluttered with people. And that made him very uncomfortable. And he had to park way too far to go out and sit in his car. So he had to find a place. So I think it's appropriate now to just ask, you know, what's the plan? I want to make sure that I can keep my distance. I want to make sure your people are safe. And anyone that, that I'm bringing in around your people is going to be, are going to be safe. Exactly. So I would just ask. Yep, that's about the best we can do nowadays. So I'm going to go find my my best mask and my best gloves, and I'm going to go meet a photographer for my new listing. So with a ring doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So on that note, thank you. We had a great crowd today. We had lots lots of people join us live, so that was really wonderful. Thank you all for taking some time out your day. And again, give us comments on anything that you would like us to uh, talk about. Uh, any topics we haven't covered, um, you know, if nothing changes this week, something tells me though with the numbers going up, we're going to ah, be getting something. Don't put it out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, okay. I, and it's just, I'm, I'm trying to be real. Good. 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 <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, I, I appreciate everybody listening to us. You know, we, we try to give you the facts, give you our opinions on it and just really warn everybody to, to be careful and do the right thing. Do the right thing. Yeah, do the right thing and be safe out there. Be safe, please. We want to keep this group happy and healthy. So on that note, we're out. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.